One important point that um, we always uh, are uh, um, willing to, to cover is uh, the fact that uh, in everything that you're gonna see starting uh, today about spectroscopy, about evaluating the dielectric function, the polarizability, either in TDDFT or with the pedestal Peter, is about uh, uh, calculating a microscopic quantity. Always a quantity that depends on many indices. In principle, with the pedestal Peter that contains really a lot of uh, arguments, we will have a lot of indices. And at the end, we want to make a connection with the, uh, the real spectroscopy. So we want to make a connection with measurable quantity that are not necessarily microscopic, right? So we have to, to, to make this connection. So in this lecture, I would just want to point it out how to make this, uh, uh, this connection. And, uh, and in particular for these uh, quantities related to measurement done on solids, because it's very often where the more ambiguous uh, definition can be. Uh, it's different for, uh, for finite system, it's much easier, even if it's not obvious to do the comparison, but it's much easier to define quantities. Okay? So, as okay. usual, feel free to interrupt at any moment. Also, because there will be a test at the end. Okay, so. Uh, we haven't seen this yet, but you probably know it already, or you have seen it uh, when you studied the uh, you know, Maxwell equation, even in classical uh, electrodynamics, you know that uh, there is a connection, in this case, a linear connection between the electric field and the electric displacement. And so typically in linear response, if you assume linear response, you, you write it in... Um, in this way, where you have a field that is related to the external uh, charges, it's an external field, but you want to know what is the field inside your medium, and this depends on your inverse dielectric function. And uh, you can write the same thing, and this is what Valerio will use uh, for TDDFT in particular. But we will use it also for the medicine Peter is in terms of potentials. You see, it's very, uh, very similar. And uh, what this says is that if you apply something, a potential in a one point in space, except a point in time, for example, here would be an R prime. You want to measure what is the effect of applying a potential in R prime, you want to measure it in, a, in another point in space, in R. Of course, if the system were homogeneous, you will only have. Uh, the dependence on the distance, because it would be the only thing in an homogeneous system. So here you will have R minus R prime. Since the system normally is not homogeneous, so it's not depending only on R minus R prime, it depends on uh, uh, both the points in space. But since time is homogeneous, it doesn't depend on when you start applying the perturbation. You apply the perturbation, and after a while, you see what happens. So it depends only on the difference of time. If you start your, your experiment today or tomorrow, it should be the same, right? And in fact, it depends only on t minus t prime, which equivalent in Fourier space becomes only one frequency, okay? And so this is a definition in terms of really of a quantity that's are microscopically described. It depends on each point in your space in R and R prime. So it's a quantity that clearly is not necessarily the one that you see in an experiment, right? This function here. So what do we see? In experiment, it's something different. You typically see one number or more than one number, because you can have different experiments. But you typically see, for example, uh, in the case, this is an example of the loss function that you measure in electron energy loss or in elastic space scattering. Uh, you see one number in terms of the frequency. You can also have the momentum transfer, so it depends on how you put your detector, you will have a different uh, loss function, so it can depend on Q and omega, but it definitely doesn't depend on R R prime, because you don't apply these things microscopically in different, like, different points in space, and you don't measure in different points in space as well. 
I think this is the thing that you have in the experiment. The same for, for example, the optical absorption here. Um, I try to use the same, same pictures. So in an experiment here, it's a mini setup for inelastic scattering. This is an absorption uh, setup. Okay, this is what we have. And so we want to do this connection. Now, you can already imagine what could be the connection, right? So we have something that depends on, uh, for example, the loss function was imaginary part of the inverse directed function. The absorption, like this case here, it's the imaginary part of the macroscopic directed function. So I ask you, what do you think could be the connection between this quantity that depends on R and R prime to this quantity that is just a, a number, doesn't depend on R and R prime. What it could be the connection? What do you think? Because what we calculate is something that you will see in R R prime or G G prime if we want to work in reciprocal space. But we want one number. So what is this number? If we have this epsilon microscopic, any suggestion what it could be? Yeah. Now, if I understand the question correctly, actually, it gives the resonance at this particular energy. Yeah, but the point is that this quantity, indeed, it has a resonance. So at a certain moment, we'll have, for example, a peak. Yeah. But it depends on R and R prime. But we don't measure this in R and R prime, right? What we measure is a number of your system. Okay, that's a propagation going to, uh, to uh, an excited system and coming back. What is I mean, it moves on excited. Yes. And what we evaluate numerically is this quantity here. Yeah, but sorry. what we want at the end is one number for frequency. For each frequency, we want one number, right? Yeah. While here, we will have n square number. Each number for each R and R prime, depending on our grid in real space or our grid in G space, we will have n square numbers. Too many. So what could we do? It's an average. It's an average. If you take the average, in fact, it is an average. We'll just have to verify what kind of average to do in order to be meaningful. And an average is not something ambiguous per se. For example, if you had a, a, an atom in your, you define what is your system, your box, you could say you have a quantity. You might want to discretize the space if you want to do this. You have a function in each point of space, and you do an average. You calculate the, the integral of the function in all the points, and you divide by the volume. And this is the definition of a, essentially an arithmetic uh, uh, average. So, and this indeed gives one number. So it's a, it's a macroscopic one. And this is what we want to do. We just have to pay attention now when we have the solids, what kind of average we, we have to do. But in terms of the, the procedure is, uh, is actually that same. And now again, for a finite system, since you have a typically quantity test in the case, your system, you can always decide if it is inside your measurement lab, you, you, you can define something. And uh, instead, uh, when we have a solid, especially when we treat solids like we do with um, periodic binary condition, so your system is essentially infinite. So deciding what it is that you take as your average is to be specified well, to be carefully specified, okay? Because otherwise you don't know where to take the boundaries because your system is infinite. Okay, so um, mostly the, this, uh, this concept were uh, known since, uh, since the work of um, uh, Hagler and Weiser. Uh, 
I found that have been a little bit more explicitly explained in this article of the Solme in El Fiorino. Uh, uh, and, uh, and to use a two-day notation uh, with a lot of uh, details, there is this book, which is a collection of several, uh, several long uh, review articles. It's, uh, it's very well done. Okay, so this you can, you can check. Okay, so for a system that is described in a reciprocal uh, space, we have to do this average, and so well, we can apply the, the average operation on a function that depends on R. This is for a, a function with only one uh, space value. So we expand it in a reciprocal space, and uh, we separate, and there is a reason for that, we separate the part that depends on uh, G and the parts that depends on, uh, on Q uh, because very often when we do um, when we do average of quantity, when we do measurement, we don't integrate necessarily over all possible momenta. Typically is the case of electron energy loss in which you arrive with an electron. This is the same for uh, uh, in elastic is scattered. You arrive with an electron, this is scattered at a certain angle. So now if we put the detector at a specific angle, that means that we are selecting a momentum transfer. There is a K initial and a K end. So there is only one Q as a exchange moment. So if we do not integrate over all Q, we don't want also to do this integration of Q. We will need something that depends on Q. So we want to keep this. Okay? because many of the experiments are resolved in, uh, in, uh, in Q, in moment. So we have this quantity here, that is a quantity that is oscillating, but is also periodic. And this what saves us, because this quantity is periodic. In fact, if you here substitute in the place of little r, r plus any um, vector of your uh, cell size, you will obtain again the same result. And so that means that we now can integrate that in a non-ambiguous way because it's periodic. So we can do the average in any of the cell, it will be the same result. And so if we do the integral now of this, this will be the integral only of the only part that it exists in R. And uh, you might remember that this is a delta function. About zero, G zero, sorry. So that means that this will give you a delta capital G zero. So that means that the only place that will resist of this is the component G equal zero of this sum. So at the end, taking the macroscopic average of a function in R corresponds to go to the reciprocal space and take the g equals zero component, the first component of your um, Fourier quantity. Uh, uh, is it okay that? Because from the physical point of view, this is crucial and also mostly the, 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 the most important point of this, okay? So, if you can transform it in reciprocal space, typically for all these uh, um, quantities with periodic value condition, it means that you take the first component in reciprocal space, and that's the average. Okay, so this is the, the important point. And now you can do it for uh, for a two quantity, sorry, for two dependency in space, like for the uh, inverse directive function. You can do the same. You can go to, the, to reciprocal space, get the part that doesn't depend on Q specifically, because we want to maintain that. We have a part that depends on GG prime, Q and omega and R prime. We integrate over R and R prime. And when we integrate that, 
we define this as a, a macroscopic quantity. It's the inverse dielectric function. And again, what will be if you do this, uh, this integral? Well, we will have a, a delta function coming out from this integral over R and another that comes from this integral over R prime. And so not uh, strangely, not astonishingly, it will be again the zero, zero component of your quantity written in Fourier space. So for example, typically this becomes like a matrix in GG prime. And so you take the head of the matrix, the, the first head. And this is your macroscopic uh, quantity. Okay. And so, well, this will be explained uh, uh, <laughs> later on by, by, by Valerio, the relation between the, the inverse uh, Electric factor is a polarizability, but at the end, that means that, you, for example, for fields, you take minus imaginary part in the inverse electric function, you take that component. So you have to solve in one way for chi, typically in TDPFT, or with a pencil meter, or with other methods. Once you solve it, you obtain epsilon minus one. And from this, you take the zero, zero component, you put it here. And uh, you will have your uh, loss function and you compare with it. And like we said yesterday, this quantity, epsilon or epsilon minus one, are in absolute units. So the number that you get out of it should be exactly the number that you compare with the experiment. It's not to be rescaled. It's a, an exact value. It's not in arbitrary units, okay? And in fact, the, this afternoon, uh, what you obtain is this, uh, this quantity here, and you can compare with the experiment, and what you obtain is uh, the real uh, uh, the quantity, that is the absolute number that should uh, this, this uh, function should have. And you can compare, for example, this is what comparison with uh, um, uh, electron energy loss experiment at uh, vanishing momentum transfer, so this Q is very, very small, like Simo said yesterday, typically with electron, with the, with electron scattering, it's better to go small momentum. Uh, and instead, when you do elastic is rescattering, you have better resolution at high momentum. And so this is one uh, one particular um, comparison between theory and experiment, and you will see this uh, today. And now comes absorption. And absorption, you see, is defined uh, either by uh, in an ellipsometry as the imaginary part of epsilon 2 or by doing the tier Lambert flow, you have uh, uh, alpha, which is also related to the, to the epsilon 2 and kappa. So they are all related, this quantity. And so we want to calculate this. And this is the imaginary part of epsilon, the macroscopic dielectric function. It's not the inverse dielectric function, right? So here we have to pay a little bit more attention to what we define. So <clears throat> this is the definition as a linear response function. So the quantity epsilon minus one in uh, as a microscopic quantity is a linear response because we have on the right here the applied field. We apply, for example, a field in R prime, and we want to measure it in R. So we have here the quantity that we can change at will, right? I don't know if you remember from the Lindbergh Fox theory. You have on the right the quantity that you can change at will. You have a knob with change. And on the left, you have the result of this. And in between, there is the relation, in which case the linear relation. Okay? In order to be considered as a generalized susceptibility, you have this uh, important uh, um, point to be, to be, to be valid. Okay, <clears throat> so now you would say, well, I have the epsilon minus one, g, g prime and q and omega. I can invert it. If I have the whole matrix, I can invert it. So I have my dielectric uh, function in g, g. And so I could take, as we know now, in order to take the macroscopic average, I could take the zero, zero component. And I define the macroscopic dielectric function 
has the zero, zero component of my epsilon, right? And unfortunately, this is um, um, this is wrong. You cannot do that. And uh, that means that we have to verify what is specifically here now that we are considering with absorption. And the point is that with absorption, uh, With absorption, we have something different. So, in the in the in our uh, in our um, uh, question that that is the correct equation where we have epsilon minus one, you see, in order to obtain this quantity um, macroscopic, is quite easy because we said, okay, let's suppose that we apply a macroscopic field here. That means g prime means zero. So this is a macroscopic uh, quantity, and if you want to measure a macroscopic response. It's easy, we take the zero component, and so here we will have the zero, zero component. So it's easy to verify what is the limit of uh, the macroscopic, let's say the macroscopic limit of an equation when it's written correctly. It's written in the correct, uh, in the correct way. And now we ask, for example, if we apply a macroscopic field, typically the case of a plane wave incoming, which is a uh, Extending the whole universe, no, and we want to verify what is the uh, the response again macroscopic. We know how to do it. And the point is that in the macroscopic world, and this again, you probably now remember that uh, you always seen uh, the equation written like this. Didn't you? Typically, d is equal epsilon e, which is not wrong. It's also correct, but it's sort of the other way around. What so? We, which is which? If you look in the in the in the in the Jackson book, you will have it mostly like this. And why is that? Why we said that this is the correct way? And sometimes you have seen it like that. And in fact, they are both correct, but they do not work in the same realm. You see that here I didn't specify R, R prime. These are macroscopic quantities. And in the macroscopic world, we have to verify what is the quantity that goes on the right, the quantity that we can change at will. And unfortunately, for, for example, for a photon, if we can consider, for example, as a plane wave incoming, this perturbation is much bigger than the, than the system that we want to consider. For example, even the wavelength of a photon in the visible range, for instance, it will be uh, bigger than the cell. In its cell, it will be super sub angstrom, and your, uh, your uh, visible light will be what? Uh, six, 800 nanometers. Much, much bigger. Right? So it's seen as, a, as, a, as a, um, a field that is much larger than your system. The variation are on a range that is much larger than your system. And so in that case, we have to verify what is actually the quantity that we change at will in order to write this correction, this um, dissipation uh, correctly. This way or in this way? What is the one that we change at will? D or E? And so we can Verify this with a simple example in which we have a system and we have our, for example, in this case, electric field, but we can do the same for a magnetic field. So we have the two things that, uh, the two fields that uh, define the, your electromagnetic radiation, we have the electric field and magnetic field. Here I, I, I put only the example of an electric field with a condensator, but I could also put a, a big solenoid around the whole the whole system would be magnetic field. Okay? So the point is let's suppose that we have a situation in which my electric field, for example, contain the system. So it's much bigger than the system, which is exactly our case here, for the case of absorption when we are coming with a photon. So if uh, um, the system is contained and we apply, for example, an electric field, we can 
have here our variator. So we start changing. And once we change, we want to know what is the field, the, the, the tension that we are applying to the system. And so you, you apply volt meter between, uh, for example, here, which is equivalent here, and we look at the, at the voltage that we are applying, right? And the point is, what is this voltage measuring? So we have a certain tension that is applied from the, our variator, our battery, if you want. But then is also the fact that the system here polarized, right? If you apply a tension, immediately there will be charge going on one side and, uh, and depletion of charges from another side. So what you measure in the voltmeter here will always be a total effect of what is your tension and the polarization of the media, always. You cannot distinguish between the two. So what you are changing at will, essentially, is the sum of two potential, but you don't know in which, in which way, but this is the quantity that you change, is a total potential due to the fact that you are applying a, a, a field and your system also polarized that uh, changes the, the voltage between the two points. So what you apply in the moment in which you have a perturbation that contains the system, you always, have, uh, you always have something that is a total field, not just the external field alone, as it was completely separated from the system itself. So you apply a total field. So that means that this way to write the things when you are in this situation of a system that P is smaller with respect to our perturbation, you will have a, a question, an equation that is written like this, because it's the total potential, the one that you vary at will. And so now you can make the connection. In the, from the macros, microscopic world, you will write it like this, which is correct. In the macroscopic world, you write it like this, which is also correct. So this D, it will be this D0. This E, which is macroscopic, it will be your E0, only the macroscopic component. And so you can figure it out now. If this is this and this is this, your uh, definition of macroscopic dielectric function will be the inverse of that thing. So your macroscopic dielectric function is not uh, the epsilon macroscopic, epsilon zero, zero. No, you have to do the inverse dielectric function. From that, you take the zero, zero component, you obtain a number, you invert this number, and this is the macroscopic dielectric function, which seems more involved, but it's the real quantity to be uh, compared with the experiment. And this is uh, uh, different from epsilon zero zero. Would you know what is the difference? So if I say this is the macroscopic electric function, this is epsilon uh, n, and we say that it's different, completely different from so epsilon macroscopic, which is one of Epsilon minus one macroscopic component. Okay. This is different of taking the dielectric function, dielectric matrix, and taking the zero zero component. This are different. In what they are different? What do you think? Besides the fact that the mathematics is not the same. Yeah, also non-diagonal components. Exactly, exactly. So you see, let's see, let's reformulate the 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 the, the question as suggested. If they were exact, when taking the an element of a matrix is equal to taking the inverse of the matrix inverse taking one element, only in one case, when the matrix is. Diagonal. If the matrix is diagonal, you invert it, you obtain new elements, and these elements are the inverse of the original matrix elements, because the matrix cannot mix if it does not diagonal component. So what is this? So 
That means essentially that uh, in here we are taking into account the non diagonality let's say, of the, of the dielectric um, matrix. But for example, when this matrix will be diagonal. So diagonal in G, so that means delta GG prime, what does it mean in real space? If it is diagonal in G, in real space, it depends how on R and R prime. Yeah. Usually, when we deal with matrices, we populate some averages. We take a trace, the trace averages is radius in the problem operation. Yes, it is chosen on purpose so that we don't defer, we don't care about all the diagonalities. Why in this case, when we are talking about matrices average, we do not use trace operation? Oh, yeah. because then we, we do not care about all the diagonal elements. This could be mentioned. Is there a reason for this? Well, um, the trace of uh, <coughs> the matrix has uh, a usefulness and has its meaning. It's just not what we are after. So a trace of uh, the epsilon indeed, if you write this in another basis, for example, uh, people um, uh, use uh, not necessarily plane waves, uh, you can use a Gaussian, you can use uh, other uh, basis, uh, you can write it directly in real space. And indeed, traces of the matrix are the invariant. And you can use it, for example, to test your implementation to verify the theorem. Of error. The point is now that since the beginning, we were not interested in a, a specific, uh, for example, uh, um, quantity of your matrix. We were interested only, so, so since the beginning, the question was what is the average of this matrix? What is the macroscopic average? So the macroscopic average has a, a definition. So if you want, I want the integral in R and an integral in R prime of a function. So this is not uh, related uh, or probably will be in some way related to the trace, but uh, it's not specifically asking what is the trace. Okay. So I don't know if we actually can use this fact about the trace of the matrix to simplify the problem. I don't know. But for certain, I'm not using this as a, as a in, inside my original question. So my original question was really, I do this, uh, this, uh, this average, and now I was tempted by the fact that epsilon itself is a matrix, because if epsilon to the minus one is a matrix, I can invert it, I will have something that I can call epsilon gg prime. And uh, my point was, if epsilon gg prime is also a dielectric matrix. I can take the zero zero component, and this will be a macroscopic. And yes, this is a macroscopic one, but it's not what I would define the macroscopic dielectric function because the real one is this. Now, what I'm asking is, but if the matrix at the beginning were diagonal in GG prime, this would be the same. Yes, it would be the same, but. Uh, I'm, I'm making an assumption here, no? Why the matrix could be, how could it be that the matrix in GG prime is diagonal? <laughs> well, um, what do you mean by non-interaction? So you have, uh, for example, in GG prime, you have it diagonal. So what it would mean in uh, real space? So if it is diagonal in G space, in real space, what would be the dependence with respect to R and R prime? It's only the it's difference. Only exactly. It's only the difference. So when it is depending only on the difference, that means that your system is homogeneous and isotropic. Because uh, you apply a potential here and you measure it here, it would be the same that if you do the same calculation like this. It will only depend on the distance. So that means that the system is homogeneous if you can do that. So. When the system is not homogeneous, then we say that it contains crystal local fields. Then these crystal local fields are contained in the non diagonal component of your epsilon. And so they have to be taken into account. So that means that you cannot calculate epsilon, you have to calculate epsilon to the minus one. And then only after you calculate that, you can take the zero, zero component. And then you invert it again, which is just a number to the inverse of a complex number. And that's the correct way to do it.
And this is in fact what is coded in the code and what you're gonna verify. And what you can also verify is how much is this crystal local field? So you can imagine that your matrix is diagonal. So you neglect components in the code they, it's always uh, cheap to do the, this calculation because you just put to zero the other component and you verify what is the, the, the difference. You see how much this uh, taking into account the non-diagonal component is important. So you will do the test. It's one of the exercise of, the, of this, uh, this afternoon. And so I can conclude, once you have the macroscopic directory function, you can calculate the absorption. We have solved what you use uh, for the yields and the elastic scattering and many other related uh, You've seen uh, some of these quantities also in some of the posters. You will see that there are uh, there are uh, different uh, different uh, quantities to be <laughs> to be about. Okay, what time is it? Okay, so now let's do a little test. If you can take your telephone out. You can go to the website, it's called wuflap.com, so www.clap.com, and put the flag CCAM24. Okay, let's, uh, let's go. First question, inelastic scattering and electron energy loss are related to the same function, even though the prefactor might change. Which one? I have a few, few, few um, seconds. The real part of the directory function, the imaginary part of the directory function, the spectral function, or the imaginary part of the inverse directory function. The one different is <laughs> You want to give some, uh, some bad answer to verify someone. Okay. So as you can imagine, the correct answer was that. Okay, good. Let's go on. Which quantity gives the absorption step? So the macroscopic dielectric function, the imaginary part of the macroscopic dielectric function, or the real part of a combination of real and imaginary part of epsilon? Again, a few questions. A few seconds, sorry. Get on with it. <laughs> so far, nobody bite bait. <laughs> okay. Right. This is correct. Of course, as far as I see, only one here. There is no problem. Now, this, you should also have uh, listened to previous lecture, but so what spectroscopy would you use to measure the optical gap? Photoemission spectroscopy, ellipsometry, photoemission plus, plus inverse photoemission, and inelastic display scattering. Okay, now here we see a bit more uh, variation. <laughs> okay, here there was a, not, not a trap, but anyway, there was a, a little thing because I asked how to measure the optical gap, which is not the emission bad gap. So, the correct result is not total emission plus inverse for emission that would indeed give you a, the fundamental gap, the for emission band gap, but it will not be the optical. Because in for emission, you remove one electron from the balanced state, then you put an electron with inverse for emission into the conduction state, and you measure the energy difference of these events. And this will give you a gap, of course. In an optical gap, you do not move, uh, you do not uh, expel electrons, you do not gain electrons. 
in an optical uh, situation, you absorb a photon and the system goes from a ground state to an exact state, still with n electrons. And so this is, uh, could be similar, but it's another gap. Okay? That you measure in ellipsometry. So both today and on uh, Friday, we will treat about these neutral excitations, like the optical gap. And for the photo emission gap, we will have to wait on Thursday, when we need to talk about the Green's function approach to obtain exactly these kind of things, removing an electron, putting back an electron. And so we describe these things. And finally, what is the main feature? It's not by far the only one, but it's the main feature that you get from the loss function that you measure in uh, electron energy loss or in elastic stress scattering. So you can measure that. But is it the main feature? Sorption peak, band gap, X boson frequency, or plasma? Okay, there is an overwhelming uh, uh, majority for plasma, which is indeed uh, in the price, which doesn't mean that you cannot extrapolate sometimes band gap, very difficult, and definitely you will see some absorption peak, but it will not be the main feature because of how the loss function is constructed. It's epsilon two divided by epsilon one square plus epsilon two square, and so the, the epsilon two, even if it is big, it will be bigger in the denominator, and so you will get washed out so you will get the signal only when you have this uh, epsilon equal zero, both, or let's say small, both real and imaginary part. And so that means the plasma. Uh, this was the, the correct one. Great, thank you for playing the game. And uh, of course there will be other tests uh, uh, coming out, but now we move around because we want to know how we actually calculate this epsilon, okay? And so I will leave the floor to Valeria.